So hi everyone, uh, I know it's been a long day. I'm really glad you all have stayed for this talk. Um, so we're gonna talk about uh, what DevOps can learn from sports teams. Uh, my name is Mohit. I am the co-founder of uh, dev2prod.com. I'll tell you guys what that is a little later. Um, so let's get started. First, I want to clarify something. Um, I disagree with what Mike said this morning, that DevOps is just a fancier name for sysadmin. I don't think that's what DevOps is. I think DevOps is about enabling the business to go faster in a reliable manner, and it's about teamwork. It's about everyone working together, and that includes everyone from your business analyst to your sysadmin to your site reliability engineer, everyone working together. So DevOps is really about teamwork, I think, and uh, that's really what I'm here to talk about today. So with that out of the way, let's start with lesson number one. So I have a question for you guys. Uh, what do you think sports teams spend their time doing? Right? So most people, when I ask them this question, they say playing. But the real answer is sports teams spend most of their time in training. I'd guess 75% of their time. And this, is, this applies to teams and individuals. From a young age, when you get into um, you know, a youth division of a, a sports team, you're training most of the time, right? So this is the first lesson that we can learn from sports teams. How much time do you spend on training on your job? You probably spend your time on features and bug fixes, and your boss says you, know, you learn something on the job, right? Maybe four years of college, but at least Indian colleges don't count, in my opinion, as genuine training. Now, there is a difference between learning on the job and learning with intent. So there is this concept called deliberate practice. Have you guys heard about it? There is actually research done by uh, social scientists. Uh, there's a paper in 93 that came out. They studied how uh, experts like uh, pianists or violinists or, or chess grandmasters, how do they get to that level of expertise? And the answer is deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is systematic practice aimed at bettering yourself at a certain skill. It involves a lot of repetition. It involves feedback. It involves setting goals for yourself and eventually getting better at something that you're doing. So sports teams do this all the time, right? Everyone has a goal. You want to get better at your 100 meter run. So Usain Bolt has one goal, and that's what he's constantly aiming to improve. That's something that we can learn, right? Maybe we can make deliberate practice a part of our team culture. Maybe 20% time, instead of hacking on some random project, you can take something that's useful to your team and improve yourself in that direction. So I'm going to propose something here where you all can help. And I'm calling it DevOps Katas. Do you guys know what the word Kung Fu means? Anyone saw Adam Jacobs' keynote at ChefConf? OK, the word Kung Fu does not mean what Jackie Chan does. The word Kung Fu actually means any skill which requires an investment of time, patience, practice to master. Right? So you can actually have Kung Fu in programming or Kung Fu in chess. Make sense? Kata is another term that comes from martial arts. Kata is a Japanese term. Kata is a form that is repeated over and over again with the goal to improve. So in the Japanese martial arts, there is this concept called Shu Ha Ri. Okay? Three words. Shu means you are a... Uh, uh, shu literally means obey, I think. So in Shu, when you are in the Shu state, you just copy. You just do exactly what the master tells you to do. You do not question. Then the actions become natural to you. Muscle memory, right? You don't have to think. It, it just happens. Then you reach the next state, Ha, where you start questioning, why am I doing this and not that instead? Right? And then when that becomes natural to you, when you start asking good questions, you go into the restate where you transcend and, and where, where you start inventing and where you start innovating, right? So I think we go through a similar state, uh, states of learning when uh, we go from novice programmers to maybe intermediate programmers to expert programmers. But what I'm suggesting is that uh, as a community, we can collect 
patterns that we see that are often repeated and we can practice them. People have done this already with code kata, right? Have you all seen code kata? So what I'm suggesting is that let's do something like code kata, but for DevOps instead. And I've created a repo at, uh, on GitHub at dev2prod slash DevOps katas. So I've added two katas there. Um, they have interesting names. One is called Enigma and one is called Etched in Stone. I'd uh, invite you all to please take a look and uh, give solutions to those katas. How did you solve these problems in, in your practical life? Uh, what different approaches you used, what worked, what did not work. But more importantly, I'd love for you guys to contribute your own katas. So please uh, send me pull requests. So that's about deliberate practice. The next lesson, measurement. So this is Grafana. I'm sure all of you have seen this and implemented it. Um, sports people are obsessive about measuring things. How many calories did I eat today? What percent came from fat and carbs and protein? How, many, how much weight can I lift? What is my VO2 max? It goes on and on. The Americans have taken it to an extreme. In baseball, there is this concept called saber metrics. If you all saw the movie Moneyball, there is this uh, you know, corporation that studies baseball statistics and they come up with really, really interesting stats like, for example, there's a stat called VORP, Value Over Replacement Player which says that if I pick this guy over this guy, how, much more, how many more runs would my team make over the season? Okay, isn't that a useful stat to have? Now, I know that we measure things, but I have this sneaking suspicion that we measure things that are easy to measure. Load averages, latencies, what have you. Are we measuring the right thing? That's a question that we should ask ourselves, right? The simplest question in the Poppendick book how much time does it take to make a single line change of code and deploy it all the way to production? Do you guys have that answer for whatever you're working on? Anyone? All the way from dev to prod? So I think that's a simple thing that we ought to measure. How, how agile am I? How, how well am I doing continuous delivery, right? We measure build times, but we don't necessarily measure everything that comes before it. What about MTBF, MTTR, all these things? We, we know these facts, we know these concepts, but do we measure them? How often do I put bugs into production, right? What's the interval? So the takeaway for me is that uh, sports people are very clear about what they want to measure. They don't measure things unless they really need them. So that's a lesson for us that do measure obsessively, but think about why you're measuring something. Have intent behind that measurement. The next lesson comes from total football. Everyone knows this team, right? It's become, I mean, Messi on the uh, left there is the most famous guy in the world, but he's able to score so many goals because there's an awesome team around him that's feeding him uh, the ball, right? In the right areas. Now, total football was a, a strategy that was invented in the 70s uh, by a Dutch coach named uh, Rhinus Michel. Uh, he was the coach of Ajax, Amsterdam, and uh, also the Dutch football team later on. And uh, he partnered with a player called Johan Cruyff, who was uh, probably the Messi of his time. So what total football says is that, uh, you know how there are positions in football, right? So you have attackers, you have midfielders, and you have defenders. So total football is saying that anybody can play any role. If you, if you see space, just go for it. Somebody else will take your place. Don't, don't say that I'm the defender, I'm not going to shoot. I'm not going to score. If you're up there, if you're near the opponent's goal, just go for it, right? So that frees up your players to be more creative, to make space, to focus on scoring goals. The lesson for us, and, and I think total football is exactly equal to DevOps, is that what we should be focusing on is uh, cross-disciplinary uh, teams. You know, like if, if, I'm, if I'm a developer, I shouldn't be putting my hands up and saying, I'm not going to touch the chef code base, that's your job. I'll make changes in the chef code base too, right? It, it's awesome actually to be able to do that. Let me give you guys one challenge. Try spending one week doing someone else's job with your boss's permission, of course, but spend one week shadowing them or, or doing someone else's job. It'll make you appreciate what they do much, much more, right? I spent one week on call at, at my last job and I got woken up at night two or three times 
And ever since then, I became way more careful about the code I write, right? And that naturally leads me into the next lesson, which is empathy. Does anyone know who this guy is? It's, it's a curious choice of picture for empathy. So, so this person is an ultra marathon runner. His name is uh, Scott Urek. Incidentally, Mike uh, Place, who, who spoke in the morning about salt, is also an ultra marathoner. Uh, an ultra is any race that is longer than 42 kilometers. Okay, longer than 42. That, that's what it means. This guy is crazy. He can run 100 miles. And his, his record is, I think, 165 miles, which he ran continuously for 24 hours. Okay, 100 miles, just for perspective, is the distance between Mumbai and Pune, or Mysore and Bangalore. He does that routinely. But that's not what makes him special. What makes Scott special is, after finishing an ultra, and he usually finishes in the top one or two, he stands at the finish line, he covers himself with a blanket, and he cheers on everybody who's lagging. He cheers on and makes sure that they also cross the finish line. And that's empathy. And I think we all need to bring empathy into our lives as programmers, as software professionals, right? When a new guy joins the team, be, be supportive, listen to their opinions, respect them for what they bring to the table. Understand that different people have different strengths and weaknesses and, and empathize with them. Now, empathy can only happen if you have actually done it yourself. You have to have run yourself in order to cheer someone on. I have run the Mumbai Half Marathon, and I can promise you that the, the maximum encouragement that you get is not from the spectators, it's not from the energy drinks or the gel that you're eating, it's when a fellow runner tells you that you can do it, you can finish this race. Because he's feeling the pain too, right? He's running in the heat too, he or she. So that's what I'd like us to take away, that we are all in this together, we're all in it as a team, we should enjoy it, we should, we should make it fun, and we should empathize with each other while we're doing it. So those were my lessons. Uh, quick note, dev2prod.com is a site that we've just launched today, and we're looking for feedback from you guys. What we're gonna focus on is making bite-sized videos on, on uh, DevOps and continuous delivery. And uh, we are also um, trying to create other repos like DevOps katas and things like that. So we'd love for you to sign up, give us feedback, tell us what you think. Um, that's me on Twitter, Mohit Thate, and on GitHub, I am Pasta Farai. That comes from Flying Spaghetti Monster fame. Um, so thank you all for staying back for this talk. I hope you had a good time. Any questions? Yeah, uh, so you said about that philosophy where you spend some time doing someone else's job yeah. or, you know, like if you, you are a, say, a mobile developer, you spend some time doing web development for a week. Right. But is it a practical thing that can happen in a fast-paced startup? Have you, so like you said, you spend a time doing on-call, probably that company yeah. was big enough to, uh, you know, uh, basically afford one person switching jo uh, a role for a few days or so. But right. in a startup, when we really want to set up this culture, how, how can we manage that? So, so that's a great question. So to answer one part of it, the company where I worked previously, developers were also on call. So it was a part of my job as a dev to also be on call. Okay, so that took care of it. Um, secondly, I think in a startup, we already play many roles. I think in a startup, if, if you're a small team, then you're already playing many roles, right? You're already probably doing QA, you're doing your own dev, you're deploying your own code. So, so you, are, you already you know, have that kind of uh, feel for what all the roles mean. Um, this probably applies more to larger structured siloed teams where a person is a QA, a person is a dev, a person is a BA. That's where I think uh, it, it would be more beneficial. So I'm, I'm not sure if startups are the right context for that suggestion. Anyone? Okay, I guess we're done. Thank you.